and welcome once again to Vital Open Science 2020. Today's webinar is called IWIRE Heroes. First of all, we want to thank Vital Foundation for this opportunity and all of you who are watching us today. I'm Elia, part of the communication team of BIOC, and I'm going to be the webinar's moderator. Here beside me, we have Mireya Fernandez. She is a biochemist and she has a Master in Neuroscience, and she's going to be the presenter. Thank you, Elia, and thank you so much. We hope you will enjoy this webinar as much as we do. First of all, I'm going to talk a bit about Vital Foundation. It was created to promote culture and communication of technology, sports, and science. And together with BIOC, we have created this innovative program called Vital Open Science 2020, aimed at the schools of Alaba. BIOC is a non-profit association that wants to make it easy for everyone to do science just for fun or for bigger things and it's based in three international movements citizen science, community science and DIY biology and now we're gonna watch a video that explains DIY bio biology better. La biología do it yourself do It Yourself Bio es un movimiento internacional de ciencia ciudadana que trata de crear una versión accesible y distribuida de la biología a través de soluciones tecnológicas de bajo coste y mayoritariamente al exterior de los entornos convencionales de la biología. Muchos de los practicantes no poseen una formación académica en esta ciencia, sino que adquieren sus nociones y las practican gracias al apoyo de la comunidad. This webinar is called Eyewire Heroes, so please, can you explain to us what that means? Sure. Well, Highway Heroes is a game to map the brain. By playing, we can help professional scientists to discover how the brain works. First of all, we want to introduce you to Amy Robinson. She is one of the scientists behind the development of this game. She presented the citizen science game a few years ago in a TED talk in Amsterdam. We are going to show you a part of uh, the presentation, but we highly recommend you to look for the presentation on YouTube channel because it's super interesting. Let's see it. I wonder if I were to ask you to name your favorite innovation from any point in human history, what would you say? Okay, one, two, three. Internet. <laughs> Woo! All right. <laughs> That's a lot of innovation. I mean, I heard music. I think I heard TEDx, microwave, the internet. Uh, there's so much innovation throughout the course of human history. And if you think about it, innovation comes in more forms than just science and technology. It also comes in the form of culture, in government, philosophy. And it may seem obvious, but I find it quite amazing that all of these innovations are made possible because of the human brain. But what is the brain? Well, we know that it's made of about 80 billion neurons, which is a number that's very hard for me to wrap my mind around. So I like to put it in the context of cities. You may recognize this city. It's Amsterdam. It's a city that I'm quite fond of, that I'm also standing in. So if every neuron in your brain were a person, your one brain could populate Amsterdam 100,000 times. And that's just the neurons. It doesn't even include any of the other cell types that are in your head. And these neurons form an extremely complex network. Their cells are joined together through junctions that we know as synapses. So one cell will make a synapse with another cell, and it will communicate with that cell through electrical and chemical impulses. Now, to wrap your mind around the number of synapses that are in your head, it's useful to take an even farther step back, all the way to the Milky Way. So this is the galaxy that we call home. Earth is in it. Our sun is in it. Our sun is one of 300 billion stars in the Milky Way. Now there are more synapses in one cubic centimeter of your brain than there are stars in the entire Milky Way. And you have about 1,200 cubic centimeters in your brain. It's 
pretty complex. <laughs> and the reason that we're interested in studying these synapses and understanding what's going on in the brain is that in order to understand how our brains make us who we are, we need to map the networks of cells that are in the brain, and we need to integrate functional activity maps into those networks. So I work at Sebastian Sung's Computational Neuroscience Lab at MIT. And we are specifically focused on reconstructing synaptic level neural networks in the brain. So this is one individual synapse. The way that we actually discover these synapses is by taking a volume of brain, and then we image all the way through it. This allows us to see the individual neuron branches that have grown through that volume of brain. So we can reconstruct the branches in full 3D, and we can fit the branches together into entire cells. Then we fit those cells together into networks. And this allows us to understand the cellular level circuitry that's responsible for information processing in the brain. Now, up until a couple years ago, it took thousands of hours to reconstruct one neuron. Now, being a computational neuroscience lab, uh, the, the amazing team created some software that brought that reconstruction time down to about 50 hours per cell, which is a huge improvement over thousands. But, you know, 50 hours per cell, 80 billion cells in the brain. We, we calculated, actually, how long that would be. And so, because we're MIT, right? <laughs> so if, if you had a team of 100 people, and they were working 24-7 with today's technology, it would take about 500,000 years to map one brain. What? <laughs> right? Humans, homo sapiens, didn't even exist 500,000 years ago. We were like homo heidelbergensis, and we were just figuring out how to make spears. So, so no, we had to really think differently. You know, if we want to answer fundamental questions about the brain, about how this amazing organ results in an individual, and in all these individuals, and in people who can think and feel and learn and laugh and love, we really had to think outside the box. And so when looking for inspiration, uh, we turned to these guys. Angry Birds, right? Uh, viral online games. People spend about three billion hours every week playing online games. And so we thought, well, hey, what if we could turn our lab software into a game and make it so that anyone, anywhere could play? So that's exactly what we did. Uh, we created iWire. It's a game to map the brain. It's a relatively new project, uh, and it can be played by anyone, anywhere, with an internet connection. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, so iWire is actually the first of what will be many games uh, that will open up the opportunity to take a front row seat in making new discoveries about the brain to anyone with an internet connection. And these are some of the neurons that our players have discovered. It's amazing. If you think about when we live in history, I mean, we're in the midst of unprecedented call for collaboration from European brain projects to the US Brain Initiative and China's vast investment in biological and computer sciences. And in order to achieve the revolutions that we need in neuroscience, in order to really understand how we are, who we are, we need an influx of statisticians, mathematicians. We need designers, and we need hackers to come into the field of neuroscience and really disrupt the way that we're approaching science. And we need young people who have a curiosity about the brain to pursue fields in neuroscience. I think it is an extraordinary time, and that people in 200, 500, 1,000 years future humans will look back on today's generation, and they'll say those ones, those people, were the ones who really laid the foundation for our understanding of the human brain. Thank you. Wow, what Amy said was so interesting. I bet a lot of you are much more interested now in neuroscience. Of course they are. I mean, I really like the correlations he makes between synapses and the Milky Way. I think it's fantastic. 
So we hope you are all ready to play Highway Heroes because we are going to show you a little video who will explain you how to play, but then we are going to play together. So, video! <laughs> Welcome to iWire, a game to map the brain. This tutorial will show you how to play and navigate the game interface. Step 1. Visit iWire.org. You can sign up with Facebook or your email address. When you log in, you'll see a neuron rotating and chat in the bottom left-hand corner. Say hello! The neuron is interactive, so you can click and drag to rotate it around, or you can scroll to zoom in and out. This neuron, along with many others, is actively being mapped by people like you playing iWire from all over the world. Join in by clicking Start Playing. This will zoom you into iWire's active gameplay interface. On the left-hand side, you see an interactive cube. This is a tiny volume of real brain. A neuron branch has grown through it. Now your challenge in iWire is to map that branch, seen here in blue, from one side of the cube to the other. You do that by clicking to color inside the lines. As you scroll through, you're looking for a blue part that's partially colored in. With one click, you're able to add a volume, and this volume is actually a piece of a neuron branch. So as you see, I'm scrolling through, the plane on the left-hand side is moving through the cube, and on the right-hand side, I'm seeing the cross-sections of the branch that I'm trying to map. So what I'm looking for is actually places inside these gray lines that have not been colored in. Now the gray lines are actually the edges of a branch of a neuron, the dendrites, that we've stained gray so that you're actually able to see them. So as you continue scrolling through, you want to make sure that the branches are complete all the way to the edges of the cube. You want to look for uh, jagged edges because neurons don't have jagged edges, they're very smooth. Uh, and you want to check all the little nubs in your, in your branching, if there are any nubs, and make sure that they actually end or look for little pieces where they might continue. It's generally a good idea to scroll through one final time. Uh, you can click in the cube to take the plane to any location. Uh, and when you are done, when you think you've found all the pieces, click I'm finished. That will submit your cube uh, and you'll be awarded points based on how long it took you, how much volume you added, and how much that volume agreed with other players. After you click proceed, iWire will fly you forward to another cube. There are a few additional ways that you can explore iWire's interface. One of the coolest ones is 3D interactive neurons. If you click the gray Change Cell button right beneath Start Playing, iWire pops up a list of active cells that are currently being mapped and completed cells. You can click Explore to the right of any of these and you can zoom in, zoom out, pan around, look for synapses. Another cool thing about iWire is chat. It's far more than a way to talk with the other players online. It's actually interactive. So you can click on any player's username and check out their profile. It shows things like points, cubes, and trailblazes. It also shows accuracy, an important metric in iWire that's updated every Monday. Your profile also shows achievement icons, like the hacker badge you see here. If you click on any of those icons, it'll take you to the achievements panel in your profile. Achievements come in several different categories. As you click through them, you might notice that some are themed on various neuroscientific achievements throughout the course of human history. You can also scroll through the achievements to see more. But that's another player's profile. You might want to see yours. You can do that by clicking on your username in the top right-hand corner of iWire. You can exit a profile at any time by simply clicking outside the box. That covers the basics. Stay tuned for more advanced tutorials, and we'll see you online at iWire.org. Hey, so we hope you have entered the web page we, we told you before and we'll, we're going to give you a minute or Mozak to, is a new for you to, to log in. Uh, you have to, put, uh, to, to choose a username, a password and a valid email, but uh, they will send you an email, but it's not mandatory to go and click anything you can play once you sign up. So, okay, um, let's start. Well, uh, I hope you're all watching my screen. Here you can see a neuron. This is a neuron uh, in 3D. 
It's we can... very pretty. Yeah, it's very pretty, right? It's like a tree. <laughs> True. You can move it, you can uh, play with your neuron. Look how it is. Okay, so to start playing this game, you have to go to start playing, obviously. And... Well, you see that the game goes to one part of the neuron. Well, uh, you have to read the parts that appear in the web page. Here you will learn how to map the brain. If you need to leave, your progress will be saved. Okay, we are not going to leave, so let's go. Well, to your left, you see a neuron branch in a 3D cube colored blue. Click and drag to move it. Okay, so here we can see a neuron branch. This is a neuron branch that we know that already exists. So we can move it like simple movements. We select and we move the mouse. And in the other part, well, we can scroll to zoom in and out. Perfect. The game works. And on the right, we can see a 2D cross section of this cube. Scroll or use the arrow keys to move the plane. Notice the plane in the 3D cube moves as you scroll. That's true. I mean, you can, as you scroll, you see that this section is moving. Uh, this is because the sections of the brain are in 2D and you have to put one above another one to have a 3D structure. And this is what we are going to do. We, we are going to find out which is the 3D structure of the branch of the neuron. So, the blue segment is a piece of a neuron, right, as the one on the left. The computer started coloring it but needs your help to finish mapping the branch to the other side of the cube. That's what I said, we are going to help to find the structure of the branch. Well, the 2D slice is like a coloring book. Color inside the dark lines, click the blinking area to color it. It is super easy. You go to the blank area and you press the button and now you have colored the section. The new sections are colored in green when you are right. So a few small pieces also need to be added. You can, we can add the other pieces. Ding, 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 ding. Like this. And if you can see in the cube, we are making the branch, like we are coloring in the right part and then in the other part we can see the branch. So you have found almost every piece that was missing. When you're finished, click check my work. We have a little more to fill, so let's move it, we can see where we can fill it. Well, I think it's not super easy to see. So, ah, here, here, you see? Here, there's a gap, and here, there is another gap that we can fill, so... Okay, check my work. You got 99% correct. First, you've completed. We you did a great job. Yeah, I mean, I'm an expert, so you know. <laughs> no, it's not true. I only followed the tutorial, that's the point. So, after each cube, you will be able to check your work, da, 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 da. Okay, so move on. Let's go to another cube. Do you want to try, Elia? Okay, I'll try. Okay, so now Elia is trying. Read as you okay. as you try. Before you start your next neuron, take a look at chat in the bottom left corner. If you have a question, don't be afraid to ask. Oh yes, the other day I said yeah. hey, and people said okay. hey, <laughs> welcome. Okay, here's another branch. Remember to scroll all the way through. Make sure you find all the missing pieces. Okay. So. Okay. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's correct. And you have to scroll now so the, the slices can move. Well, do you see this part? Well, sorry. Well, this part that it's part colored, part not, you mm -hmm. have to color it because oh, so that's the entire thing. Yeah, and that's to... where the, the neuron is going. Okay, so. Would that... Oh, no, no, that is not. Oops, I but this wrong. isn't bad. No, okay. but don't worry. There's no problem because um, 
this uh, piece is being colored by a lot of people and then the computer knows um, which is the good one because most of the people will color the same. Okay. So So if I scroll again? Yes. And I look oh, that then, for example, okay. then there you can ah, cool. fill. So I can fill in that space. That And okay. here you can see that the neuron is being mm. complete. Okay, so we're creating <laughs> my neuron. Yeah, we're filling the neuron here okay. too. Yeah. You see the green bar is mm -hmm. higher now, so... Perfect. So I hope... Uh, well... Okay. So, uh, we hope you have... I hope you have uh, learned how to play Iowa Heroes. And we highly recommend you to play because we think that it's a simple game, funny game, that uh, when you play more and more you are better at playing, of course, as everything <laughs> in life. So we highly recommend you. Yeah, I think it's it's a good it's a good game. Well, as we said before, this game is a citizen science game. So, uh, what is citizen science? Well, citizen science is basically citizens doing science. With citizen science, professional scientists allow citizens to take part in their projects. For example, by collecting and analyzing data that they will use later in their research. In return, volunteers acquire knowledge and some abilities related to science and get to know how the scientific method works by applying it instead of studying at university or school. Well, citizen science is changing the way science is done because citizens take part uh, in, in the process. Citizens can participate in different ways and at different levels, from lower participation to higher. For example, we have these three levels. We have the basic level, where citizens only gather data. For example, they can go and take water samples and then send, it to, send them to scientists to analyze them. They are helping them. We have this medium level where citizens may also analyze and interpret this data. Uh, what we did um, a few minutes ago, playing IO Heroes, uh, is this second level. We are analyzing data that scientists already have. So this is great because everyone can take part, even if you don't know science. That's the point. The point of citizen science is taking part even if you don't, if you are not a scientist, yeah. because science is can be made by everyone so the third level is the highest one maybe can be i don't know the most difficult but we don't really think that it's that difficult uh, in this level citizens can participate in all levels of a project from designing the research to analyzing data and getting involved in other parts of the scientific methods well there are lots of a lot of benefits of citizen science. For example, uh, in education it's very useful because it helps to enhance formal and informal education initiatives. There are a lot of citizen science projects for schools and for scholars. Uh, it is useful also to conserve natural resources because, as I said, there are also a lot of projects related to conservation and uh, it can support environmental sustainability. And how can we take part in this movement? Well, as I said, there are a lot of projects. And today we are going to talk about some games, okay. some citizen science games. Uh, here we can see MOSAC. MOSAC is a scientific discovery game about neuroscience. By playing, uh, we can help scientists to build models of the brain and uh, of brain cells so they can uh, learn more about the brain. In this game what we will do is trace the shape of neurons in order to classify them and discover new functions related to their structure. Okay, fun. Yeah, I, I think it's very fun. Uh, we have a little video, a little tutorial, so you can learn how to play in Mozart and we highly recommend you to look for the page on the internet and play. Let's see it. 
Mozak is a new science discovery community with the goal of significantly speeding up neuroscience breakthroughs. It does this by turning everyday people into neuron experts. There are 86 billion neurons in our brain, and we want to understand how they work. The first chapter of Mozak presents you with images of an actual neuron. The community then traces along all the branches, exploring and discovering every nook and cranny. The result? A full 3D model of that neuron. Future chapters of Mozak will enable you to classify different types of neurons, figure out how their shape relates to their electric signals, and possibly even make a functional model of the brain. Anyone can be a neuroscientist here at Mozak. Join us. Oh, and I have another one. Here we can see a game that allows scientists to measure our memory. And we can also improve it by playing this game. Yeah, and it's a super easy game. You uh, have to download the game from the Play Store and uh, you must click the, rest, the red circles just where they were before. It's a simple memory game and it's made by, uh, uh, by the scientists from the York University, the University of York. So I think that these games are related to the brain, so I think we should explain a bit more about the brain. What, what is the brain? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, I think it's very useful for us to explain you what is the brain. So the brain is the most important organ of our body. The brain is what we think, it's what we feel, and basically it's what we are. Without the brain, we are nothing. The brain is located inside our heads, I mean, I think that's obvious, and it weighs around 1400-1500 grams. Here you can see the parts of the brain. As you can see, each part has a function. For example, uh, the motor cortex, motor cortex is responsible for the movement, the sensory cortex for sensations, but although in the image they seem to be separated, this is not true. These boundaries are not true because these parts are connected between them uh, through the neurons. And what are neurons? Because I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> for those who don't know what neurons are, as Elia, neurons are the fundamental units of the brain. They are specialized to carry messages. The human brain has approximately 86 billion neurons. Wow, that's super huge quantity. And uh, for you to know what is this quantity, is the capacity of the Menizorosa Stadium more than 4 million times. I mean, you need more than 4 million Menizorosas to put all <laughs> your neurons there. <laughs> so it would be impossible to count them myself. Uh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think it could be. I'm so sorry, Elia. I think that's your, so your wish, but... Okay, so here you can see a diagram of a normal neuron, no? Uh, these neurons have as other cells a body with the nucleus, it organelles, but they also have, a, due to their specific function, some parts that are specific for the neurons. For example, we have the dendrites, the axon that is covered by a substance called myelin. These parts are super important for this, for carrying the message. In, this, uh, in the other image, uh, we can see neurons in a brain section. These neurons are dyed with the Golgi stain. Yes, this is the same guy as the Golgi apparatus. Uh, thanks to this stain, Ramon y Cajal, who was only one person, not two, Ramon y Cajal really? was one person, yeah, he was wow. one person. He was a Spanish neuroscientist that discovered this, that neurons are the fundamental units of the brain. Because of that, uh, both were given the Nobel Prize of Medicine and Physiology in 1906. And I have a question. Do all, of these, do all of the neurons have the same shape? Well, not really. Uh, we have some different neurons and depending on their functions and location. Here we can see some of them. This game we talked about before, Mozart, yeah. is very helpful uh -huh. to discover these structures and functions of the neurons. And how do they communicate with each other? Yes, that's a very good question. <laughs> they communicate with, uh, through the synapse. Synapses uh -huh. are tiny spaces where the neurons release small molecules called neurotransmitters. 
that alone allow one neuron to communicate with another one. This information travels super fast in order to reach every part of our body. Here you can see the connectome. This is an image from the Human Connectome Project. It's a very ambitious project that wants to uh, discover the connectome. Well, the connectome is the map of the brain. It's a map of all the connections and cells that are in our brains. By playing Highway Heroes, we are helping professional scientists to make this map. And related to this topic, we have interviewed Alejandro Carretero. Alejandro is a neuroscientist that works in Achuca Robasque Center for Neuroscience here next to us in uh, Leyoa. Let's meet Alejandro. Okay, so today we have uh, with us Alejandro Carretero. Alejandro works at Achucarro, is the best center for neuroscience. Alejandro is a biologist and he always wanted to know how things work, especially living things. And well, he has decided to find out how one of the most complex things in the universe works, the, the human brain. Hi, Alejandro, how are you? Fine, fine. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's great to have you here, Alejandro, with us. Um, um, tell us a little bit how um, and since when are you a biologist, a scientist, and what was the reason for going into neuroscience? Okay, it was a, a good process. I don't remember the exact point, but uh, since I was a teenager, or even before at the age of 12, I knew I like science. No? Uh, but it was uh, uh, when I was at the university, uh, when I studied the concept of the cell, you know, how, how this such a small thing could have so many things inside, the, the mitochondria, reticulum, Golgi, uh, and it was able to do uh, a so high number of processes and capable of a huge degree of specialization. It was at that point uh, when I, I, I decided not to, to, to uh, to become a scientist, and especially when I saw the the the, the miraculous uh, world of the neurons, uh, when I wanted to to become an, a neuroscientist. Yeah. All right. Well, now you are a neuroscientist. Um, you finish your PhD in uh, Seville, and you are working at the Chukarro Bas Center for Neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about your project. What are you doing? Um, in, in your laboratory, what is your research about? Okay, so here in, in our lab, we are currently trying or we are developing a new genetic tools that uh, will allow us to, to study it in, in a better way the, the nervous system. So, for instance, in that, let's imagine a brain structure uh, during a learning process, not all the neurons in, in, in that brain structures are going to get activated or recruited by that process, only about 8 to 10 percent. So now with, with those tools that we are developing, we are able to, to tap, to level those neurons, and even we are able to manipulate them. So for instance, we can activate those same neurons that were recruited by a learning process and see what happens, or we are able to inactivate them. So uh, we can, for instance, reduce the, the, the fear expression of an animal in a, in a situation that normally would produce fear on the, on the animal by inhibiting those neurons, for instance. Okay, now for all the young people that is watching us, yes. can you tell us a little bit about this process of learning, how it, how it's, it happens within the brain? Well, that's, that's, that's the, the key point, that's, uh, a process that we are we are trying to to disentangle how, how it works the molecular mechanism and, and but the hypothesis that now we are working with is that uh, new memories are formed but the, the, the creation of new synapses um, connections between neurons yes we need those connections to to be established in order to to acquire new paradigms new information new uh, thing is a store in the brain, let's say. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and now you, you are identifying how these connections are being formed, which neurons are involved, and also 
you are also working with manipulating uh, genetically those processes, correct? Correct. Yes, this is we, we are, what we are trying to, to establish, how these connections are established and, and then to modify them to see what happens. Um, we, we have to, to modify things and see the effects to learn about the process. All right. Well, this webinar today is about um, citizen science applied to neuroscience research. And specifically, we're talking about a project that is using games um, to help um, scientists map the brain, map the human brain. Can you tell us, in, in simple words, what is the connectome and why mapping the human brain is complicated but also very important? Yes, well, that's not so difficult to, to explain. But I mean, that basically, the connectome is it could be the map of all these connections that the neuron are establishing between them. Uh, so the, the problem or why is it so difficult to, to, to map these connections or map the brain is uh, a question of numbers. So the main factor is the, the, the magnitude that we are, we are talking about. There are about 86 billion neurons in the human brain. And even getting to that number was not so easy. So only a few years ago, we, we came to that exact number. Then the next problem is that we are not only talking about those elements, but how they interact with each other. So they are very highly connected, one, one brain structure to the other. So a speculation would be that we are talking about 10 to the 15 uh, connections. So it's 10 and 15 zeros. That's a, huge number. I cannot imagine it even. So uh, just to have an idea, uh, last year, uh, the Allen Institute uh, got a milestone by mapping using the electron microscopy one cubic millimeter of a mouse brain, which has 100,000 neurons and 1 billion of uh, connections in it. So taking into account that in the human brain, there are as many neurons as the stars in the Milky Way, even using those sense of those microscopes, it will take us like thousands of years to, to complete this task. So we need, we need new methods, we need computational power, and we need imagination to, to, you know, to, to be able to solve that problem. And also the help of um, non-scientists or non-professional scientists, the help of citizens, um, it looks like um, there is plenty of work to do and plenty of gaming in order to, to, to help in this process of mapping the brain. Let's imagine that we are uh, a little bit into the future and, you know, we have mapped the brain. What games or we have a map a big part of the brain? What is the difference? What, what change can it bring um, to society and to, to science? Um, when we reach that point? Well, at least we would have those roadmaps, let's say, uh, to, to know uh, the path that the information is, is following uh, within our brains. Now we need to understand how, how the different uh, structures, nucleus, are communicating, uh, and, and that's difficult to uh, we will need new methods to, to understand that because, as I said, the computational uh, power that we have now will not be enough to, to process that. But, but it's a very, very good starting point to, to at least to know uh, what regions are, very, are connected and the strength of each connection that can vary. Uh, it would be really important uh, for, for the, the knowledge of the human brain. So, uh, in a way, um, mapping the brain is, is also a way to understand ourselves, to understand how our memory works, how our personality is formed, um, but also some, some diseases, some, or maybe some personality-related, uh, well, differences are formed, correct? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that knowledge will be key to understand how, how some pathological processes uh, are, are happening to our brains. So uh, the, the, the way that the, this connectivity changed during the, uh, 
I don't know, Alzheimer's disease and other pathologies, uh, it will be important. Uh, it will be important to, to be able to, to come with a solution for that, no? to know how uh, the connections are modified in respect of the, let's say, healthy condition. Yeah. Neuroscience is an amazing topic. Um, basically, it is the, the, the knowledge of ourselves and our thinking processes of, of you know, Oh, it's, it's fascinating. But um, tell us, what is what is the, the what you um, perhaps find most interesting within neuroscience? Um, something something maybe that you can tell uh, young people um, that are listening to us at the schools. Why is this so fascinating? Or what about it do you find more amazing? Well, it's difficult to, to sum up, no? but it's a very it's a very seducing field that requires uh, different points of view, no? different fields of the science. But what what probably is, is most fascinating for me is the learning process. This is what in which I did my PhD. How how the brain can can incorporate new information and adapt to the environment. How can uh, learn to do new things, uh, ride a bicycle, or for me it's amazing how the plasticity and the uh, capability of adaptation of, of the brain is, is, I cannot describe it, so this, this is what I would like to, to keep on working on, no? to, to learn how, how we can learn, <laughs> which is paradoxical. <laughs> uh, it is fascinating. You mentioned a very interesting word, plasticity. Yes. Which means that the brain it, it can be uh, it can it can change it, it, it is um, like plastic yeah that's the word comes from um, that can be modeled that can that can can you tell us a little bit what is brain plasticity? Well, brain plasticity is I mean all those things that we were not made for but the brain is able to do for instance the the the, the piano we can play the piano but there are no pianos in the nature, no? or, or, or bicycles or cars, so, but still we can do it. We can rewire in some way our motor cortex uh, to learn to do new tasks that, that the human has never done in, in his history. So that, that, that capability is, is amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Well, to finish, uh, the same question we ask all our guests. Um, would you like to give, um, do you have any advice, um, since you are working in neuroscience and learning processes and so on, um, do you have any advice for educators and any advice for students that you want to share? For, for educators, uh, be patient with, with the students and, and, and passionate with them. Don't show everything you love and, and people will see uh, how interesting things are, and especially in science. Um, and for students, don't be shy. Uh, get closer to, to science, make questions. There are no wrong questions. The wrong question is the one that is not made. So uh, get that, you should Excellent. give a closer view to science, yeah. Excellent, Alejandro. Well, I think it's a fantastic advice. Um, thank you so much for participating. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And Hope to see you soon uh, um, in other um, science-related uh, events. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And apart from playing games like iWire, what can we do to improve our brain? Well, there are a lot of things that we can do to improve, improve our brains. For example, first one, do sports re regularly. There are some uh, studies that, uh, says, that say that uh, doing sports, for example, before an exam, uh, allows you to get a higher mark than uh, if you don't do sports. Uh, doing sports promotes the neurogenesis in a part of the brain called hippocampus. So if you want to get an A+, plus, do sport. Yeah, <laughs> do sports <laughs> regularly. It's very good for your brain. Then, um, you have to sleep well, have a good resting, a good sleep is always a good recommendation. For your age, you have to sleep more or less um, 8 hours per day is the, the, um, the best for you. Well, 
uh, there's another thing, uh, you should give a chance to meditation or mindfulness. There are new studies uh, that say that this technique is good for your brains and, well, I think it's good for you to be, no, to be relaxed. So maybe something about meditation yeah. at schools, something different. And there are a lot of podcasts. Yeah, there are a lot of podcasts. You can listen to this podcast too. Well, uh, you you should always eat healthy, avoid um, food that is unhealthy, maybe processed. yeah, processed. Maybe not always, but okay, have a healthy diet. It's always good for you and yourself and for the brain. Um, you also uh, have to socialize, empathize, and help others. This is mandatory, and there's a thing uh, called brain. Uh, no, sorry, <laughs> neurobic. Um, you can see the, here a uh, brain doing <laughs> sports. It's like metaphoric, but you should do this. This neurobic. It consists in, for example, doing something that you always do uh, with one hand with the other one, or do things with your eyes with your eyes closed. Uh, I always say the same example, uh, if you always brush your teeth with your right hand, start brushing them with your left hand. Uh, this way your your brain is going to make new connections and it's going to be healthy and, and more active. So to finish with this uh, webinar, we challenge you as always, we have two challenges. Um, the first one is an easy one, is to take part in citizen science or neuroscience projects that already exist, for example, by playing these games that we explained, or you can search for new ones. And uh, the second one is more ambitious, uh, is to create new citizen science projects with the neuroscience centers here in the Basque Country. Uh, there are two important centers, uh, the Atsukara Basque Center for Neuroscience, and the Basque Center on Cognition, Brain and Language. It would be great if we can create citizen science projects related to the brain. Yeah. You, schools, can mm -hmm. speak with us, BIOC, and all together we can speak with these uh, organizations to create citizen science projects. Citizen science, as we said, is super important for people to, to improve their abilities. So we think that there are two giants well, that we can do all together. So to finish this webinar, we have a really cool video. We've inter interviewed Mar Cortez. She's a scientist from the Basque Country, but she's working in New York in Sina Mount Sinai Hospital. So she's very passionate about neuroscience. And let's see what she has to say. So we have uh, with us Mar Cortez. Mar is uh, from Tumaya, um, she's a medical doctor and a neuroscientist, and she's specialized in um, rehabilitation. She's co-director of the Abilities Research Center at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Hello, Mar, welcome. Thank you for having me, hi. It's a pleasure having you. Mar, can you tell us a little bit um, what awakened your interest in neuroscience? How you are a medical doctor, how have you ended up doing research in neuroscience? That's a very good question. I, um, I was very happy being a clinician. I thought that uh, caring about patients was the most beautiful thing that I could possibly do. That was my purpose. But I did realize that um, um, we didn't know enough. Some of my patients, I couldn't give them uh, the care um, that they really needed and, and uh, there were no solutions for them. Um, so I really needed that um, we need new things, new treatments, novelty. And in order to do that, to go and find something else, neuroscience uh, came along. So um, I moved to the United States and I started my career as a scientist. Fantastic, Mar. Well, um, tell us, what do you do specifically? What are the lines of research in a place that is you know, in, uh, called the Abilities Research Center? So uh, uh, our center, um, what it does is uh, research for rehabilitation. So we're trying to bring innovation 
to uh, people that they have mainly neurological disorders. So some kind of damage to their brain or to their spinal cord. And just for you to have an idea, when you damage the brain, depending where you, are, you have the damage, you can stop talking, you can stop seeing, you can be in a big amount of pain, you can never walk again, you can have tremor. So in order to make those people better, we partner with different companies and bring together different kinds of technologies for them. We do a lot of things with video games. We work with uh, companies that they create that, these suits to make people walk again, people that they are paralyzed. Um, so we basically say, yes, you can, to everybody that has been told there is nothing that you can do. Fantastic. Yes, you can, definitely. Well, this seems very applied research. And, and, and talking about research, uh, COVID-19 had a huge impact in New York City. Um, what kind of initiatives did the Abilities Research Center develop to deal with COVID-19? Yeah, so it was really hard in New York City. Um, everybody was, was um, at home and everything shut down and, uh, and everybody was really scared about what was going on. Uh, so what we did was, uh, to, uh, to try to bring a little bit of, uh, of uh, de-stress to all the health um, workers, right? People that they were going to the hospital to take care of all these patients, they were so sick. So one of the things that we did was to create the recharge rooms. Um, we partnered with some um, artists in our community to create these spaces with uh, healthcare workers who will come and will be able to relax. And uh, they were using biophilic design that is really like bringing nature into a room, right? Uh, our idea was that uh, when you are in nature, biological things change in your body and also in your brain, right? You are less stressed, you become more happy, and you're able to focus better. So by doing this, we improve the stress levels of our, of our doctors, and they were able to care better for our patients. And we also partner with this uh, company to do an, an app so we will be able to, um, to track our patients' symptoms through, their, you know, through the app when they were at their homes. Because with COVID, nobody was, I mean, it was so dangerous to go out and to get, um, you know, um, to get COVID. Um, so we try to give the best possible care through innovation, through apps, through your phone. Everybody has a phone. So, and that was really, really great. We have over thousands, well, thousands of, of patients in those apps. How interesting. So you have used a bit the idea of biomimicry, imitating nature um, in order to get those good things that we feel when we are connected to nature, but in the hospital setting, yeah? Absolutely. At some point, our aim is to, to um, when a patient enters the hospital, the healing process needs to start. So we, uh, we want to put like sensors in everybody just to, to be able to know how this person is in the environment. The hospital needs to be something, something nicer. Imagine entering into a forest. So that's the idea, but also always measuring how the healing progresses. Fantastic. So this research can move into um, making hospitals uh, better places where we feel better, where we feel happier. Um, with better conditions, yeah. So uh, with with better chances of, of healing and of healing faster, yeah. That's amazing. Right. Um, well, Mark, um, tell us something. What is what you find most interesting about neuroscience, your research, the brain, our nervous system, all these things that you are studying? Mm -hmm. um, well, to me, I it was very clear to me since the very beginning that. Uh, the brain is the most mysterious thing in the in the human body, right? I mean, uh, the brain controls everything. Who we are, it's in our brains. Um, how we behave, what we do, what we like, who we love, it's all in your brains. So to study the brain for me uh, means to try to understand who we are and how to make people that they have brain injuries, for example, their lives better. And uh, I love how complex it is. Like, um, the connections that they are in between the neurons inside your brain is, uh, is the same as, uh, as the stars in the universe, right? So if you are able to understand something so big, um, you have the feeling that you can understand everything. 
So to me, understanding how the brain adapts and changes over time, it's, very, it's really precious. Not only like, not only learning, for example, new things, but also taking functions with this damage, taking functions that did not have before. Like when people are blind, the area that sees in the brain, it becomes an area that because they don't, cannot see anymore, that it's able to read with your fingers. Um, and this is, this is neuroplasticity, that's the brain adapting. So to me, it's fascinating. And not only that, you can pass little currents in the brain and rewire the brain to do different things. Um, I don't think that there's anything better than studying the brain, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, it sounds very exciting. Um, well, Mar, to finish with this um, short interview, um, I want to ask a question that we ask all the scientists and all the people that we talk um, for these webinars. Um, do you have, uh, because these webinars are, uh, are mainly for, for um, school, uh, schools and, and educational centers, do you have any advice for educators? Do you have any advice for students? Any advice? Many. Uh, I, uh, I love kids. I think that education, it's, uh, it's mandatory to, to make this a better place. And, and I'm very serious for us, uh, not only to understand better how we can heal our brain and any other disease, but also how to be better humans and create like a social justice. Uh, so I will tell the educators, keep promoting curiosity. Like kids are so curious always, right? We need to inspire them and make it fun. I mean, in rehabilitation, when you are when you are sick, when you are damaged, what we do is instead of doing repetitions that is super boring is let's make them play. Play is everything. Um, and that's how you get, you know, to be able to be very interested in something and, and make maybe a career uh, out of it. So I would say definitely play and try to understand, be very curious and, and inspire. Don't, don't put ideas in somebody's brain. Like, Give them, give them um, feathers so they can fly, right? And find their their own uh, their own questions to answer. How interesting and and really suits so perfect because today we are talking about gaming applied to neuroscience research and how um, you know kids and, and and youngsters can can actually play these games and contribute to the work that that scientists like you are doing um, to understand the brain. And as you said, to make this a, a better world and make us better humans, isn't it? Absolutely. So, well, thank you so much, Mar, um, for, uh, for this fantastic um, um, interview and all these ideas that you shared with us. And we hope to see you soon in any other event uh, of this kind. And well, um, take Definitely. care of yourself and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. bye bye. So sadly, we have to say bye for today, but we're really glad we've made this webinar. I've learned loads about the brain and neuroscience. I'm so happy, I'm happy <laughs> you have learned. <laughs> and um, we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. So keep doing science, make sure you do that. And yeah. Yes, of course, we, we should keep doing science. You should play all the games that we, we explained because they are super interesting, super fun. You're helping scientists and maybe that's the part that makes you want to, to play. I don't know, but you should. And always we want to thank you and Vital Foundation for um, giving us the chance to make these webinars. And, and we'll see you in the next one. Yeah.